Buckingham Palace, official London residence of Britain's sovereign since 1837, is probably one of the world's most famous addresses and has an outside that is familiar to all and an inside that is wrapped in mystery. Its quadrangle and grand entrance is the ceremonial centerpiece for the nation's welcome, be it to kings, queens, presidents or diplomats. And it also provides the same welcome when, for a score or more days a year, the doors of the grand entrance are open to recipients and their guests to receive their honour at the investiture ceremony. And once more, down, down towards the camera now. Good. Right Nowadays, tens of thousands of people see the state rooms and gardens either as guests to one of the series of summer garden parties or as visitors to the summer opening every August and September. But very few get this special invitation. At 8 o'clock in the morning, London is already alive to another working day. And for the select 130 men and women who are anxiously making their way to the capital, it's the culmination of many weeks of preparation. It's the day of their investiture at Buckingham Palace. Preparations at the palace are well underway. Everything in the state rooms, including the ballroom, scene of many state and official occasions and where today's investiture will take place, are given detailed and careful attention. 20 investitures are held at Buckingham Palace each year, nine in the spring, two in the summer, usually in July, and nine more in the autumn, although this can vary from year to year. For most of those receiving an honour, this is probably the first and only time in their lives they will be received by the Queen in the ballroom at Buckingham Palace. The honour system and the concept of the investiture as we know it today is relatively new, given that the history of the monarchy spans over a thousand years. Honours for chivalry have been around for centuries, but it was largely due to the Queen's grandfather, George V, who, in 1917, established the Order of the British Empire, so that honours could be more widely given to deserving citizens from all walks of life, men and women, for their contribution to the war effort. With the ending of the First World War and the armistice in 1918, the King extended the range of recipients to include those from the world of science, the arts and literature, as well as the voluntary and charitable sectors. A short walk from Buckingham Palace across Green Park at St James's Palace is the Central Chancery. It's part of the Lord Chamberlain's office and is responsible for administering the orders of chivalry and maintaining the records of all appointments, promotions and deaths within the order. They also take the lead in organising investitures and the sending out of invitations together with warrants signed by the Queen. And I see we've got 101 recipients. Yes, we've lost one from there. One DB to begin, followed by three knights. Right, so they put in the stool. 
um, after the dame and then take it out after. Yes. No, any special notes? Um, Mrs Kelly is deaf and dumb and she will have a, a sign language interpreter with her who will help with the conversation. Right, well, we must get, definitely put that on the notes. Mrs Sandra Newbury, uh, she's going to live in Australia very soon, so that might be of interest. Yes. Good. Yes, that's very clear. Following the compilation of the New Year and the Queen's Birthday Honours lists, the details of the awards are first checked against records held by the Central Chancery before being sent out for publication in the London Gazette. When the various insignia arrive from the manufacturers, each decoration is very carefully scrutinised for blemishes and then stored in the central chancery's vaults to await its recipient. The investiture is a very special occasion, and each recipient will take away an impression of magnificent sights and sounds that will be long remembered and talked about. Part of that sense of occasion is given by the Yeomen of the Guard arriving here from their headquarters at St James's Palace. Created by Henry VII in 1485 after his victory at the Battle of Bosworth Field, they are not only the oldest of the royal bodyguards, having given long, faithful and continuous service to the sovereign for over 500 years, but they're also the oldest military corps in the United Kingdom and probably the world. There is no doubt that investitures are stage managed with military precision. Each recipient must be in the right place at the right time, be briefed as to what to expect when reaching the dais and what to do once the honour has been presented. The timing is well rehearsed and must be accurate for it all to begin at 11 o'clock. The green drawing room, the first of the state rooms at the top of the grand staircase, is richly furnished and includes chairs made in the 1820s for Windsor Castle. It has a grand piano purchased by George IV in 1820, originally destined for the music room gallery at Brighton Pavilion. And on top of the cabinet below the portrait of the Duke of Wellington is a 1758 serf porcelain potpourri vase that probably once belonged to Madame de Pompadour. It is just one of the many staterooms frequently used for receptions. But today, while the room is readied and the props are set, there is time for new knights to get acquainted. Ladies and gentlemen, um, can I just ask you to, to move in that direction with your backs to those doors? Um, and I'll attempt to explain what's going on over the next hour or so. Um, in the green drawing room at the moment, which is above the state entrance th uh, through which you came just now, um, the actual investiture itself takes place um, starting at 11 o'clock in the ballroom, which is about um, 100 metres behind me. What I'm going to do um, is actually walk through that process, if I may, uh, pretending that I am for a, one very privileged second yourselves, um, and, um, and take it through from there. Um, as I say, we'll take you in, in a crocodile um, through to um, the, the ballroom um, annex, looking into the ballroom. You'll be in a, in a doorway, very similar to the one that's behind me now. Alexander will be your cue to move forward. Forward you go. Pull in alongside Colin, waiting for your surname, recall, recall surname, move forward, three or four paces, centered on the queen, turn to the left. Dip of the head, curtsy. Move forward. If you're going through the stool routine, you do that. So Sir Louis, uh, Sir Ian, and Sir Stephen, who are to receive um, the knighthoods, your job here is to come forward, put your left foot against the, the um, left-hand edge of the stool. With your right hand, take the handle, go down onto your right knee. Um, keeping your head nice and erect, um, the sword will be placed across your, your, initially your right shoulder, then your left shoulder. There'll be no words said, so there's no arise, a hero, or anything like that. <laughs> OK? <laughs> um, and then, so, so as soon as that accolade has been received, so touch, touch, She'll move away with the sword. You come up immediately. Go to the left of the stool. Now, everybody's back in the picture at this point now. 
received the award. Remember, it's a neck decoration to dip your neck a little uh, to allow the queen to get it over your head. Um, conversation, shake of the hand, back we go, three or four paces, dip of the head, curtsy, to the right, out of the door. George IV's original palace lacked a large room for state and official entertaining, but Queen Victoria rectified that shortcoming by adding the ballroom in the mid-1850s, first used in 1856 for a grand ball to celebrate the ending of the Crimean War. These days, it is one of the rooms used for the annual diplomatic reception attended by 1,500 guests, ambassadors, diplomats and their wives accredited to the court of St. James's. It is also the setting for state banquets, concerts and performances of the arts. But way back in 1856, it had the distinction of being the largest room in London, but today it is just the largest room in Buckingham Palace. At 122 feet long, 60 feet wide and 45 feet high, the ballroom could, with clever stacking, accommodate 56 double-decker London buses. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. How nice to see you here at Buckingham Palace. Importantly, may I now just double check that there's no one present who is due to receive an award? A highly promising start. I think we can continue. You will probably have read in the inside cover of the blue booklet what happens during an investiture, but I, th I thought it might be useful to take you through it. There are normally around 24 investitures held during the year at Buckingham Palace, plus one at the Palace of Holyrood in Edinburgh, and one at Cardiff Castle, a grand annual total therefore of 26. Each one at Buckingham Palace is on average for just over 100 people. Today's total is 105, supported by your numbers of 310. Investitures are usually held by the Queen, as is the case this morning or by the Prince of Wales on behalf of Her Majesty. London investitures are always held here in the ballroom, which is the scene of state banquets, also the annual diplomatic reception and other state occasions. Shortly after I finish speaking, five yeomen of the Queen's bodyguard, of the yeomen of the guard, will enter the ballroom and take up position here on the dais the Yeoman of the Guard is the oldest royal bodyguard in the world, having been founded in 1485 in the reign of King Henry VII over 500 years ago. Shortly after 11 o'clock, the Queen and her party will enter the ballroom by the big door on your right. She'll be escorted by two Gurkha orderly officers, a custom instituted by Queen Victoria in 1876. Please stand when Her Majesty's party enters the ballroom. The string orchestra of the Band of the Blues and Royals, under the command of Major Douglas Robertson, will play the national anthem. And I would ask that you remain standing until Her Majesty bids you be seated. The investiture then begins. Lord Luce, the Lord Chamberlain, announces the name of every recipient who enter in turn through the door on the left. After they have been invested, each recipient leaves through the door opposite, after which they re-enter at the back of the ballroom to be given a seat amongst you for the remainder of the ceremony. Please may I ask you to remain seated throughout, because if you attempt to stand, others behind you will have difficulty in seeing what's happening. Could I also ask you to confine your conversation to a low whisper since, if there is too great a general buzz, it's really quite difficult to hear the next name being announced. A final point. However great your admiration may be for a particular recipient, may I ask you kindly not to applaud? Thank you. At the end of the ceremony, the Lord Chamberlain will come forward and stand facing Her Majesty the Queen. This is a signal for everyone to stand while the band plays the national anthem. Next, Her Majesty, accompanied by the Lord Chamberlain, 
the master of the household, the equerry, and the two Queen's Gurkha officers will walk down the central aisle and exit the room. After Her Majesty the Queen has withdrawn and the remaining ceremony officials have left the dais, would you then please leave by the door through which you entered? Your newly decorated friends or relations will join up with you at the back as you leave. The investiture normally takes around an hour. Thank you all very much for your attention. I feel sure that you will enjoy the ceremony. Thank you. Before the ballroom became the centre for state entertaining, Queen Victoria used the picture gallery for large banquets. It's 155 feet long, the length of two tennis courts, and was designed by John Nash, as were many of the state rooms, for George IV to display his outstanding collection of Dutch and Flemish pictures, many of which still hang here. When completed by Nash in the late 1820s, it lacked good light and therefore was not a great success as a gallery built to display fine works of art. And it wasn't until 1914, under Queen Mary's guidance, that it was remodeled to include natural daylight and top lighting, which is how we see it today. There are pictures here that were collected by Charles I, Frederick, Prince of Wales, eldest son of George II, by George III, George IV, and Queen Victoria. Right, well, just to, just to quickly explain where you are, um, presently in the picture gallery, uh, pretty much in the centre of Buckingham Palace at the moment, um, and we'll take you through fr uh, from here at about 11 o'clock, between 11 and um, half past 11, uh, through the East Gallery, which is behind me, some distance through the ballroom um, where the um, investiture actually takes place and as I say starts at 11 which the Queen will, be, will, will start then um, through the ballroom into, a, into an annex that runs parallel with the ballroom. Um, you don't have to worry about all of this because we'll get you there um, <laughs> and um, we'll get you there in a, in a series of crocodiles um, in the right order so the right person receives the right award of course um, and I think it's really the best way for me to be able to describe this to you is for me to pretend for a second that I am you and just walk through the routine um, that you'll be expected to do from 11 o'clock onwards. Um, and what, I, as I say, we'll get you into, um, into a position, into a doorway, very similar to the one I'm standing in now, behind of which um, is the annex, and you'll be looking forward into the ballroom. You're at the head of the queue now. Um, directly on your left will be um, Alexander Scully, who's one of my staff, who will, for the last time, I promise you, check off your name. Just to set the scene, as you look into the ballroom, on the right are some 300 or so of your guests seated. Above them is an orchestra playing. On the left is, um, is a dais, a low dais, about nine inches high, centered on which is the queen. On her right is her equerry, who is there to remind her who you are, why you're here. And on his right is the Lord Chamberlain, Lord Luce, who's the head of the Queen's household, who will be making the announcements to the uh, over a public address system um, as to who you are, why you're here. So that's, that's the sort of the scene that you, you're, you're faced with. And directly in front of you is Rear Admiral Colin Cook Priest, um, who is the um, gentleman usher, one of the gentleman ushers to the Queen. Um, and um, he is your last safe port of call ahead of you. <laughs> Otherwise, after that, you're on your own. Um, <laughs> Now, Alexander will, will release you at the appropriate moment. So, as I say, there's no thinking required at all until this moment. Um, Alexander releases you. You go forward. And I would ask you, please, to stop alongside uh, Colin here, who can issue you any final instructions should you need them. Um, and what you're waiting for now is to hear your surname over the public address system. Your sur there'll be words before, there'll be words afterwards, but it's your surname that is the cue for you to move forward. When you hear that, Move forward the three or four paces that it takes to be centered on the dais. Turn to the left, facing directly the queen now, who's probably about five or six paces ahead of you, as I say, on a low dais. Um, when you get to this point, gentlemen, please bow from the neck, little bow, and ladies, little curtsy. Move forward then, once you've done that, to the edge of the dais. 
get quite close to it so that when the queen gives you your award, she's not falling off the edge. <laughs> or indeed, you're not climbing onto it, I would hope. Otherwise, it gets very crowded up there. Um, so you're close enough to the dais um, uh, for her to be able to put on your hooks, which I see you all have now, um, the, um, the um, uh, medal or the brooch that you, uh, that you would receive. Um, during the course of that giving, there will be a conversation, a two-way conversation between, between yourself and the monarch. Um, you'll know that that conversation is coming to an end when she offers you her hand. That is the moment so you also take her hand, uh, shake it, and that is the moment to break contact. And I would please ask you then to go back three or four paces to the point where you started this whole procedure. When you get here, dip of the head again, curtsy, turn to the right, and out of doors that um, will be straight ahead of you there. When you go through those doors, we'll take your awards off you, box them up, give them back to you. <laughs> <laughs> It's much more generous than that, I promise you. <laughs> um, and then usher you back into the, um, into the ballroom where you join the guests uh, to, to witness the balance of proceedings. All very, very, very clear, I promise you. Um, what do we call the Queen? Your Majesty first time, ma'am thereafter. Ma'am, if it's all too difficult to remember on the day, on the, at the moment. Um, we'll start taking you through at about sort of 11-ish um, onwards. And um, I hope you have a lovely day. You will do. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. The scene is set, the briefings are over, and the investiture is about to begin. It is 11 o'clock. Please be seated. Thank you. 
On view throughout the palace is a treasure trove of art that establishes the royal collection as one of the major collections in the world today. There is a feast of fine paintings by such great European masters as Rubens, Vermeer, Rembrandt, Van Dyck, Poussin, Zuccarelli and Canaletto. There can be few waiting rooms in the world that offer their visitors such a wonderful display of original art as these staterooms give today's recipients and their guests. Honours and awards are not given lightly. They've been justly earned and the investiture ceremony is the country's acknowledgement of that particular achievement. Many countries in the world today have honours and awards of one sort or another, but nowhere is the bestowing of titles and decorations performed in such splendid surroundings and with such grace, style and ceremony. Mr. Lawrence Edmonds for services to pension reform. Investitures are traditional, and I'm, I'm always absolutely fascinated by the people who come and uh, all the things that they, they've done and they all have different reactions. They all um, can tell you something different. And if you ask the right questions, or if you, uh, you know, if you know a little bit about what, what happens there, you can always, it is always different. Some of them are very cleverly discovered. I think that's very important. So the, the system does discover people who do unsung things, you know, that, that, uh, that perhaps the local people know about, but nobody else does. And, and I think that's very satisfactory. One mustn't have a long conversation, obviously, because you'd never, never finish. The question you ask is what is you hope that you're going to, to, to get the, the, the answer that you want. Some say that, that this is this is for the people I work with. It's it's a it's a you know it's it's a representation rather than than for themselves, which is also nice. This is also meant to be a, a pat on the back, and I think people need pats on the back sometimes. It's a very dingy world otherwise. Each investiture ceremony lasts a little over an hour and brings together not only those whose achievements may have been brought to our attention by the media, but also those who have not sought publicity, but brought to the fore by the investiture ceremony. As today's investiture comes to an end, there can be little doubt that the day will have given lasting pride and pleasure to all.
unbelievable. You can't, you can't describe how you feel. It really chokes you up. A fantastic day and so well organised, it's unbelievable. Oh, she was uh, very relaxed and uh, able to ask uh, one or two questions about uh, what I did. Tremendous atmosphere, tremendous occasion. I thought it was wonderful that she had the apt question to ask. <laughs> you, you, you're in a world of your own at that moment. It's, you're not part of the ceremony at all. It's just the Queen and you. I think it's very rare to see um, a palace operating in the way that those great paintings show you palaces operated in the last century and the century before that. And I think it's the spectacle. Uh, plus, I think, meeting some very special people. It's nice to be recognised for anything you do, but to be recognised at this level is particularly important. It's something that's unique to what you've done, and uh, therefore it's, it's that wee bit different. It's not something you can buy. You can even buy a flight now to the moon, but you can't, uh, you can't buy a flight in here. It feels marvellous, yes. It was a great experience for myself and my family, yes, marvellous. Well looked after. Everybody's very friendly, but everybody at their ease, yeah. She was so gracious, so absolutely marvellous. And in uh, her daughter, Emma Ruff, she said, uh, it gives me a particular pleasure to make these awards. <laughs> yeah, so it, was, it was lovely, yeah.